Hey everyone, this week we're going to be looking at 8 ways AI can enhance your photography. So AI, or artificial intelligence, has been getting a lot of media attention lately. You may have heard about it, and as the technology improves it's only going to get more and more popular. But what actually is it? I think the simplest explanation is that it is getting computers to solve complex problems that in the past would have only been achievable with human intelligence. So perhaps when we apply that to photography, a good example would be if you're using something like Photoshop and you wanted to isolate your subject from the background and in the past we would have used something like the marquee tool and you would have to painstakingly draw around your subject by hand so that you could cut them out from the background. And then we got improvements to that, things like the magnetic lasso tool and magic wand and they helped a little bit, but they weren't always perfect. And we've developed now two tools that can automatically assess the scene with artificial intelligence, work out where your subject is, and isolate them from the background. And that's just one example of how AI can aid photography. And there are so many more, and I can't include them all in this video, but I've picked out eight of what I think are some of the most interesting ones. And these can exist in your hardware, such as your camera or phone, or in post-processing software. And I'm only going to cover tools which will help you improve the creative process of making a new image. So for example, there are tools out there that can restore old photos using AI. I'm not going to cover anything like that because that's not creating something new. Like I said, I'm only going to focus on things that will enhance the process of creating a new image. So let's dive in now and look at the first one. Okay, so we're going to start off with quite an obvious one and that's sky replacement. So lots of people know about this one, and I think that speaks to how popular AI is becoming now, because there are lots of different opinions on whether you should or shouldn't be using sky replacement, but one thing is for sure, most people know about it, and there's a lot of software out there at the moment that can replace skies. And this is one of them, it's Luminar Neo. I find it particularly good at replacing skies and really simple to use. So I'm gonna take this image here, which is of the Bixby Bridge in California. And we're gonna come down here on the right to Sky, Sky AI. And here we can really quickly just choose different skies to add a little bit more interest to that rather blank blue sky that we had to start with. So it works quite nice with some of these blue skies because it was a daytime shot. But we can also choose evening shots, like these sunset ones. And the good thing is it will relight the scene as well. So if we've got one of these skies, such as this one, for example, it's quite purple, quite pinky purple. If we drop down scene relight in here, you'll see when I bring up the relight strength and saturation, that's actually altering the colour of our foreground and all the features here. If I turn that off, you see it's recolored to match the sky. So that's quite clever. It will work out the colours in your sky. And even better than using one of the inbuilt skies, it's always better to use one of your own. So I'm going to use this sky here from a shot I captured at Kerber Edge. I've already imported it, so I can select it just here. And you can play around with the placement of that until you get something that looks right. And it's just a bit more reassuring to know that you've used your own photography and all the elements are your own. If you're entering competitions and things like that, sometimes the rules state that all of the elements, if you're creating a composite, all of the elements are your own. So that's something worth bearing in mind. Right, so next up we're gonna be using Photoshop to create depth blur in an image. So I'm gonna be using this image here, which I captured in Camden Town in London. And I want to make it look like I've got a shallower depth of field. So I want the man in the front here to be in focus and probably these doors on the right, but everything else in the background, I want to be out of focus. So I'm gonna come up to filter up here, come to neural filters and I'm gonna come down to depth blur, which is here, and just turn that on. If you've got a little download symbol like this, 
you need to download it first before you can turn it on. So that's already analysed the image. It's worked out where the man is. It's worked out that's the key subject in my image. And it's kind of masked him out. It's blurred the background, but he is remaining in focus and sharp and not blurred. And you can play around with these parameters. You can change the blur strength if I want a more blurry background. And you can also untick focus subject if you want and then you can manually work out where the focal distance should be and how much of the image is in focus or not. So it's a really quick and accurate way of creating that depth blur in your scene. And you can also do this with a lot of smartphones these days. They have a setting sometimes called portrait mode or it'll be called something like background blur and it will automatically work out just like this what the key part of your scene is and it'll blur out the background for you when you point and take the picture. So while we've got this guy on screen, we'll talk about the next feature, and that is subject tracking. So this is actually a hardware tool which exists in your camera or smartphone, and lots of modern cameras and phones can do this now. But it basically allows you to point at your subject, and as you move your camera around, it will work out using AI what's in that scene. And if you've got humans or sometimes animals, it will work out where they are in the frame and keep focus on them. So if I point my camera at the gentleman here, you'll see we've got the little frame trying to lock onto his eye. If I press OK there, it's going to lock on. And as I move around, that is continually focusing on the gentleman's face. And depending on how sophisticated your hardware is, this can work out eyes, animal features, human features, all kinds of really clever things. So that's a really useful tool for all kinds of things like portrait photography or bird photography where you've got a moving bird and you want to keep focus on it. So if your camera can do it, it's a really useful tool, check it out. So next up we're going to cover denoising. Ideally we want to capture an image which has got the minimum amount of noise in it possible. However there's sometimes factors that you can't control which are going to create noise in your image. If we look at this one where I was at Agden Rocha, I'll put a link up top to that video. I, it, we had really strong winds that day and even though I was on my tripod, the winds were so high and so powerful that it was actually causing a lot of vibration. And because I was shooting at 105 millimeters here, that meant I needed to have quite a fast shutter speed just to stop getting camera shake in the image. So I was at ISO 320 and because I was trying to preserve my highlights the raw file actually looks like this. So the highlights are okay but I've got a lot of dark areas in the foreground and I've used Lightroom to bring up those shadows and that looks fine from a distance. But if we zoom in here we'll see we've got quite a lot of noise in those dark areas. You see all this speckly foreground and we can use some of Lightroom's own denoising features. So if we come down here to the detail palette, we can bring up the noise reduction with the luminance slider. And you see that noise starts to go away. The further we bring this slider to the right, the softer the image looks. So that's great to get rid of noise, but you see we've lost a lot of detail now. If I bring that down, we get so much more detail back in the image. So we need to use some powerful software which will analyse the image and work out how to get rid of that noise but retain the maximum sharpness possible. And there are different softwares out there. I like to use DxO Pure Raw. So when we open that software up, we're presented with this interface. And from here, I can drag in my raw file and come up to process photos. I'm choosing deep prime, so the most powerful method. My output format is going to be DNG, so it's still a raw file. I've got my location set up where it's going to output that file, and I click process. And that's using the AI now to analyze that image, working out where to reduce the noise and where to retain the detail. And at the end of it, we should have a raw file which we can bring back into Lightroom. So we'll get this dialog box popping up 
asking what we want to do next. We click export to Adobe Lightroom Classic, click export. So this is back in Lightroom now. If I just copy the settings from this image onto the new deep prime image. Now we can zoom in on that. I can zoom in on the other one. And you see this is the image without the deep prime noise reduction. And this is the image with it. So it's still nice and detailed, or as detailed as it can be, but we don't have any of that nasty noise. So a really powerful tool, and I use this all the time, particularly with bird photography as well, because when you're shooting birds, you need really fast shutter speeds to capture the birds in motion. And that often means that you're having to compensate to get enough light into the camera by having a really high ISO. So it's really good for bird photography as well. So for this one, we're gonna look at upscaling. So upscaling is when you take a small image, but you make it bigger. But you're not just making it bigger, you're adding resolution to the image. So we often want to do this when we've got a heavily cropped image. And I find that most of my heavily cropped images are bird shots, because no matter how big your lenses are, sometimes you just can't get close enough to the birds to get them to fill the frame. So we've got an example here, this Kingfisher. What I would normally do is just come into the crop tools, bring that down to focus on the bird so it's filling the frame and you can see that's a much better composition, much larger bird but we do lose a lot of detail because even though the Z7 is a 45 megapixel camera when the image is this heavily cropped you are just using a small portion of that 45 megapixel image. So to upscale that, we need to use AI. And this is kind of cheating in a way because what AI does, it looks at the image, it enlarges it, and it kind of fills in the gaps with what it interprets as the best solution to fill those gaps. So the stuff it fills the gaps with doesn't actually exist in a way. It's kind of looking at the rest of the image and saying this area, this gap, should be filled with something that looks like this. And it does do a really good job, but it is important to note it's not technically real, if that makes sense. If we take a look at this image here, this is of a little owl, and this wasn't a heavily cropped image actually, it was quite high resolution, but I've reduced this purposely in Photoshop. And this image is only 235 pixels wide, so it's very small. And you can see when we look at it at a large scale, we really have lost a lot of that resolution. It's heavily pixelated. You can see all the little individual pixels there. But what I'm gonna do now is bring this into some software called Topaz Gigapixel AI. And you can see already what an amazing job that has done. So when I move this, you can see that was the original. If I stop moving, it'll apply the process into that and it's filled in all of those gaps, got loads of detail around the eye, and you can choose different options here, two times, four times, this is how much bigger it is than the original. And this is actually coming out now, a 1880 pixel wide image. So that's perfectly printable, and when you consider that's come from a 235 pixel wide image, that is really impressive. So if you've got an amazing shot of an amazing bird, Sometimes it is worth it to use AI to rescue that shot and upscale it this way. Okay, so this next tool doesn't really fall into the category of enhancing your photography. However, it is a great quality of life tool for anybody who works as a photographer or is a keen hobbyist who's got hundreds and hundreds of images. And it is actually Google Photos. So it's free, you get a certain amount of storage with a free account, and anyone can get a hold of this. And this is a great cataloging and search tool which will use AI to look through all of those images that you've uploaded and it'll work out what is in that scene. So you can quickly find those by coming up here into the search. If I type 
woodland. You'll see it comes up with all of the woodland images that I've captured. Or I could type ocean for example and then we get all these kinds of images. So it's really quick, it's really fast and this is also built into other cataloging tools such as Lightroom. So if you turn that feature on within Lightroom you can do quick searches like this and find all of the images in one particular category really quickly. Here's a shot I captured during a shoot with a band from the north of England called Numbered Days. And with this one, I want to highlight some of the AI features within Lightroom, particularly the selective masking tools. So I've got my image, which I've done some editing on already. But what I want to do is select all of the people in the image. And we can do that really quickly by coming up to the masking tools. And you'll see here under people, it's already processing and detecting people. So it's actually pulled out all of the people in the shot individually but we can also select all people here and that's a really quick way if I come down here to create mask of selecting your primary subjects and then I can play around with the shadows bring those up I can bring more clarity into those people and all the things that you want to do to bring your subject to life within your scene. You've also got other AI selective tools in here, such as select sky, select background, select subject. So those are all really powerful and really quick ways of selecting your main features in your images. Okay, so finally we're going to look at something that's really cutting edge. It's getting a lot of media attention for good reasons and bad reasons. But there's no doubt about it, it's around to stay and it's going to get better and better all the time and that's AI art generation. So there are various tools out there, you've got Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey, this one is Dali 2 from OpenAI and this is a web based tool so you can create an account, you can log in through the browser and all you need to do is just type something into this prompt. So for example I could put foggy atmospheric woodland scene with cold blue tones and we click generate and so there we go there's our images you'll see these are quite realistic very accurate to what we put into the prompt it's really quick and easy to do that but obviously this is not photography and I made a video a little while back about how this is affecting photography and what the future is for photographers. And I'll put a link up top to that one if you want to go back and watch it. Basically what I was saying in that video is rather than rejecting this new technology, I think we should embrace it and see what it can actually do for our photography rather than how it's going to potentially ruin it. So A, it's a great inspiration tool. You can ask it to generate these images and then you can go out and have a great time, lots of fun with your camera, trying to emulate these scenes. Another way you could use this is to generate skies. So when I was talking earlier about sky replacement, you could put one of your images into here, so a sky that you've captured, and then you could create variations of it. And then you can put that into your software for sky replacement, so Luminar or Photoshop and use that to replace the sky. So I'm not going to do a sky right now. I'm going to use this image here, which I captured at Wyoming Brook in the Peak District. I'm going to click open and we need to just click crop there. And what we're going to do is click generate variations. So again, it's going to start thinking, it's going to analyze that image. That's where the AI is coming into it. It's looking at all the features and it's going to use it's AI to then create four variations based on the features within the image that I uploaded. So here we go, we've got the original here. There's a variation, another one, another one, and there's the final one. So all very similar, but slightly different. Perhaps take these images and create a composite in Photoshop, layering them all up together 
to create a really creative image. So there are lots of creative possibilities. If you're taking journalistic shots, documentary shots, or anything like that, obviously you're not gonna do anything like this. But if you're creating art from photography, it's great if you can use your own images and you can use an AI art generation tool like this to create variations of your own work and then bring those back into your own photography. So you're still utilizing your own photography, but you're enhancing it with the AI tools. So there you go, that's eight ways that AI can be used to enhance your photography. I know this is a controversial subject for many people, but my own personal view is that these tools are not gonna be going away, they're only gonna be improving and becoming ever more present. So we need to be thinking about how we can use them to our advantage, rather than how they might destroy photography or anything negative like that. But there are ways that they can be used that are more in keeping with what we think about as photography. And I think the key thing is using your own source material. So rather than just generating completely new stuff, which is basically art, not photography, it's about still generating your own photography, but then using the AI to enhance it or augment it or change it in some way that will overall improve your final image. And if we can do that, we can make use of these tools. We can get better images. They're gonna be artistic images, pictorial images, we're not going to be using these for journalism or documentary photography or things like that. But if we're creating art, these tools are very useful and I think we should be embracing them really. So check them out, explore it, it's really good fun. See if they can improve your photography. So that is it for another video. I know it's been a long one, so if you've stuck around to the end, massive thanks for that. If you're a subscriber, I really do appreciate it. And if you're not and you'd like to be, you can click down there on the big red button or over here on this picture of me. And that way you'll keep up to date with everything I'm doing each and every week. There's a new video every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. UK time. So I hope you'll join me next week for the next one. But until then, thanks a lot everyone and bye for now.